Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to Agri-Food Conversations brought to you by iSelect Fund, the Van Trump Report, the Yield Lab Institute, and Family Farms Group. My name is David Yoakum. I'm an associate here on the iSelect Fund Ventures team, and I'm excited to welcome you to our discussion today. Agri-Food Conversations is all about driving innovation in agriculture. Each month, we highlight a specific theme, including emerging topics such as soil health, plant genetics, vertical farming, and aquaculture, to name a few. This month's theme is crop diversity and seed genetics. On today's call, we're joined by Jerry Feidelson, CEO of Agribody Technologies. Agribody Technologies is, is leading the crop development revolution by licensing and co-developing patented crop yield enhancing technologies. Its unique genetic technology has been shown to increase crop yield, improve stress tolerance, boost disease resistance, and lengthen product shelf life. Now, each of you knows that companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We've invited you to this call because you're some of the smartest, most talented people in Agribody's network. Uh, you are potential customers for Agribody's products and services. Uh, you have built a company similar to Agribody, or you are a sophisticated business person or agricultural professional who understands the market and the challenges and opportunities Agribody may face. Before we get started, we have a quick poll question to get a better idea of who we have on the call today. Please take a few seconds to answer. And a few process while that poll is running, um, we are not soliciting investment. This presentation is to pr provide information to help agrobody technologies find customers, mentors, and other strategic relationships that can help them grow their business. You are all on mute, and you can use the chat window to ask a question at any time. Typically, um, I will answer questions towards the end of the presentation, um, and it is better if you ask the question through the Q&A box as opposed to typing in the comments section. Um, if you could please do that. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay. And so without further delay, I am pleased to introduce Jerry Feidelson, CEO of Agribody Technologies. Jerry, please feel free to take it away. Thanks very much, David. It's a real pleasure to be back. Um, I gave a talk similar to this about a year and a half ago uh, on this platform. So it's a delight to kind of update you on what, what's going on. I'm just having a little trouble advancing. There we go. Okay, so um, the title of my talk today um, is uh, at the leading edge of increasing sustainability and affordability, increasing food production and reducing uh, food waste. And the contact information is here. I'll repeat it again on my last slide. The outline of my talk for the next 20 minutes or so is I'll describe the problem that we're working to solve, mostly food waste, but also increasing yield and stress tolerance. Uh, how we uh, developed the solution and where we are now. Uh, and finally, I'll end up uh, concluding. The main problem we address, as I mentioned, is food waste. Um, of all the food that's produced in the world today, about 1.3 billion metric tons. That's enough to be 2 billion people. A lot of uh, introductions five, six years ago in ag tech or ag biotech uh, had to do with increasing yields by 70% to feed the additional people we're going to have on the planet in the next 30 years or so. Well, that may be true, but we could also uh, save, save a lot um, and feed those people by just a better distribution, better shelf life, and other technologies. Uh, the loss is even greater in certain crops, up to 50%, even 70% for some highly perishable vegetables. The economic cost is over a trillion dollars a year, mostly in the developed, con developed countries, but also in emerging countries. Um, we are, as a result of food waste, uh, there's an enormous amount of methane and CO2 emitted. If food waste was a country, it would be the third worst country in the world after China and the United States and ahead of India and Russia. The UN has a very ambitious uh, development goal. One of them is to cut food waste in half in the next seven years, which is extraordinarily ambitious. I think we need every technology available to try to do that, including genome editing and advanced plant breeding. But I wanted to first uh, give you a little bit more about the, uh, the, the scope of the problem. So here there are five, it's, it's broken, food waste is broken into the five different components of the food chain from on farm to post harvest to processing to what's lost in retail and what's left in, lost in consumer shelves and refrigerators. Um, and you can see in the blue on the left, it's about a third of the food that's wasted is actually food loss. It's wasted on the farm. 
And if you're going to waste food, the best place to do it is on the farm. Typically, it just gets plowed back in because you save all the um, economics and social and environmental costs of shipping and storage. As you move farther to the right, the impact of food waste is greater. So you can see, for example, unless the most the least developed countries in the world, like Sub-Saharan Africa, only about four percent of food is wasted. Whereas in the developed countries of North America, it's so it's ten times as much, forty percent. Um, so it's important to have a little bit of granularity, understanding where and how food is wasted. Um, I had a real issue with trying to wrap my head around what does 1.3 billion tons really mean, or a trillion dollars? So there's just too many zeros on that. So um, I learned that about um, 180,000 tons of food is wasted in the United States every day. So here's a picture of uh, the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. And again, I apologize to um, uh, the Trojan and the Bruin fans in the audience, but if we put all the food waste in the United States in one place every day, like the Rose Bowl, it would fill it up. That's how much we throw it. This one is a little more manageable consent. So what happens? Well, I already told you about the trillion dollars of direct financial loss. That's what we see. But there are a lot of secondary effects um, estimated to be almost as large, how much it costs uh, food uh, waste to the environment. And uh, here are just a few, a few examples of, um, of impact. So how do we solve this enormous problem? Obviously, it's been recognized and dealt with in many ways. I sort of I sort of bin them into physics or chemistry. So physics is if you just lower the temperature of perishable fruits and uh, vegetables, that works. But of course, there are large costs. A lot of um, uh, uh, continuing investments required for the electricity and the trucking and the shipping. And a lot of countries just don't have that infrastructure. Another way to deal with it is to exclude oxygen and increase the amount of CO2 or nitrogen that surrounds the food, either in packaging or in storage. Some of some more innovative approaches involve semi-permeable membranes and things like that. And then there are coatings, and this has been going on for decades using carnauba waxes and companies like Appeal from Santa Barbara have raised ridiculous amounts of money uh, taking agricultural waste products and converting it into coatings. Uh, that are edible. Our approach is to complement those physical and chemical methods with genetic or biotechnology. So what we do at Agribody is provide our customers, typically seed companies, uh, with technology that allows them to reduce the activity of a key gene that's required for crops to decay quickly. We do this in the lab once, and all progeny from that genome edited plant um, have the same trait. Uh, so there's no there's no operational expenses, uh, no need for continued treatment like the other methods I described. And of course, during COVID-19, going to the supermarket less often certainly has a lot of value. How do we do it? Well, first of all, we use elite lines. We're not interested in using our technology in, let's say, academic lines just for proof of principle. We only go into the best lines, best varieties that seed companies already have. We want to make great lines better. We don't, we don't want to make okay lines good. We do it by knocking down a gene called DHS that is universal. It's in six of the seven kingdoms of life. Um, the only kingdom that doesn't have this switch that I'll talk about are true bacteria. We use CRISPR to uh, make a mutation in a very targeted place in this gene. It's conserved in all plants. Um, we take those new seeds and uh, propagate them and the crops typically have a three to four time extended shelf life. And we've already proven this in multiple crops, including tomatoes, bananas, lettuce, flowers, and uh, certain row crops, um, not just in the lab in the greenhouse, but in field trials in the case of bananas and alfalfa. Here's how the switch works. And it's kind of embarrassing being a PhD in genetics from Stanford, I have to give all of my science essentially in one slide, and it's a cartoon. But you can see there are these two genes uh, represented by these gray circles. The product of this gene essentially decorates that gene. Um, it's called DHS, which stands for deoxyhydrosynthase. And my co-founder, John Thompson, discovered many years ago 
that if he reduced the activity, if he reduced the expression of this gene, um, of this gene, or increased the expression of that gene, um, it's, uh, he was able to modify this analog switch. Keep in mind, this is not a digital switch. It's not on or off. It's, it's really how much DHS is produced that matters. And when John reduced the amount, John Thompson from the University of Waterloo reduced the amount of DHS represented by this blinking red circle, we're doing this now by genome editing, reducing the activity of the gene. Or if he increased the amount of its substrate, rice the uh, EIF5A, then in both cases, whether you get less of the DHS or more of the EIF5A, he found three traits in almost every plant he looked at. I already mentioned the extended shelf life, but he also found increased biomass, both of the vegetative in the case of alfalfa and seeds in the case of oil and many other crops. And also these plants became much more tolerant to stress. So when I saw this slide, I sort of crossed my arms in skepticism. I said, how can you get three such important traits with a single down regulation of a gene? And John explained to me that it's because all of these things are due to senescence. Um, that is programmed cell death. It's called apoptosis in the case of animals in plants of senescence. So by reducing senescence, whether it's caused by intrinsic aging, whether it's caused by pathogens that are external in killing cells, uh, whether it's due to environmental effects like drought or high temperature or low nutrients, cells that would normally die with wild type levels of DHS do not die when there's less DHS around, whether it's lower amounts of a normal protein in the case of transgenics, or whether it's in the case of a normal amount of a messed up DHS protein, the same effects were found. And here's some data in two important crops in tomatoes. So when John did anti-sense the DHS in tomatoes, he found that these six week old tomatoes look as good as one week old controls. And there's no difference in nutrition or profile or anything else that was measured. And the same thing in bananas. I don't know how many of you are Costco shoppers, but this top, this top row of bananas reminds me of Costco. They're either green or over the hill. And in the case of field trial um, uh, decrease in DHS, the two-week-old bananas look as good as the few-day-old uh, bananas. This is with um, ethylene ripening. Same thing works in flowers with carnations. The uh, three-week-old carnations are, are, are losing a little bit of their life, but it's a whole lot better than the controls even at one week. And then we proved a couple of years ago, and that was this was the basis of our patent filing, that when we knock, put a mutation, a deletion in one copy of the DHS gene in rice, we got much greener leaves, and we also got about 25% increase in the size of the grain. The architecture, the numbers of panicles, they were very similar. The plants looked normal, they were just greener, and they had larger grains. Uh, just a word about regulation. Um, it's very important to understand that at least in the United States and many other jurisdictions of the technology, which uses the CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing, is not classified as a GMO. You can think of three levels of regulation, classical breeding, which is unregulated, genome edited, which had been lightly regulated, and transgenics, which were highly regulated. And thanks to the passage of the SECURE rule last summer, um, it turns out that if you're making a mutation with a point mutant or a single deletion, that is regulated as a, as a conventional bred crop, uh, which is to say very light or unregulated. And here are three examples of products. Um, Corteva is coming out with a waxy corn. Um, there was uh, some interesting work done at the University of Florida with jointless tomatoes. And I think the first place prize goes to uh, Calix that released Kalino oil, which essentially knocked out of fatty acids and saturates, which, which converted soy oil, soy oil to have a lot of the properties, health properties of olive oil. And that's been, been on the market for a year now. Here, here are 10 countries that consider genome edited crops uh, to be more like conventionally bred crops than transgenics, I think led by the United States and several countries in South America, as well as in, um, in Israel and um, in Japan. So we've got 15 issued US patents on transgenic applications with some foreign counterparts. We've got a couple of applications in on editing and we just received 
um, a notice of allowance and the patent on genome editing will um, issue in a couple of weeks. How do we make money? Uh, we're not an academic group or a for-profit for small private company. Um, we license our technology. In some cases, we co-develop it. Um, we hope that soon we'll be able to offer um, licenses to address trait, for example, in long shelf life tomatoes to a number of tomato companies and other vegetables. And someday we may sell seeds directly. In terms of the market, um, we thought we'd focus first on tomatoes. Um, the, uh, the solanaceous crops, such as eggplant, pepper, and tomato, um, and potato, it's not listed here, have about 40% uh, of the total seed market, which is $11 billion a year. We think our, our, our SAM is about one-tenth of that. And so if you combine the fraction of, um, the, tomato, of the nightshades, the solanaceous crops, you have about 24% uh, or so of, uh, of the entire market. So that we think is kind of the big save, but we still also have work going on in other crops as well. We've raised 1.6 million in convertible notes. Uh, we've demonstrated proof of concept in multiple crops listed here. We filed key patents internationally and we've gotten about half a million dollars in revenue so far. We've got nine customers and the crops indicated here. Um, so including strawberries and roses, a, a biofuels crop called Camelina, uh, which is very exciting. Um, Simplot has done three years of field trials and is very excited about our technology. I mentioned tomatoes. Um, we have a potential deal in alfalfa and, um, and uh, licenses in, um, in sweet corn and uh, soy. So to summarize, um, well in advance of my 20 minute deadline, uh, we've got proven technology, very broad IP, uh, field trial data to back it up. We've confirmed that genome editing reducing activity of this key gene gives very similar traits to genetic modification using down regulation. We've got a very good team of entrepreneurs and we've got excellent traction. As I mentioned, we closed our seed round. We've got revenues from nine crops, and we're in the process of showing extended shelf life of tomatoes and other crops using genome editing. I just wanted to close on a kind of personal note. Um, being an entrepreneur has a lot of advantages, uh, but there are some drawbacks. So I found some slides when I was going through, I don't know, 3,000 slides with my parents about a year ago. And uh, these are pictures of me when I was nine months old in my aunt's backyard. So an entrepreneur is really happy um, when we close a deal or we raise some money or we have an exit. So this is an example of that. Uh, other times we really have to be careful about using our funds and making sure we have enough money and don't run out. So this picture was taken uh, before Excel. So I had to count on my fingers and then Every other time is anxiety. I'm sure the entrepreneurs in the audience will relate to this. So with that, I'll close. And um, here's my contact information if you want to get in touch with me. And uh, I'll open it up to uh, David for, for questions. Thank you so much, Sherry. And thank you for the, uh, for the surprise ending. It was, <laughs> it was the twist that no one was expecting. Uh, but yeah, certainly. Uh, illustrative of, of what it's like to be a founder and an entrepreneur. Um, but thanks again for the great presentation. The food waste problem is an extremely large and extremely important problem to be working on. Um, so really happy you're able to share with us today. For any of the members of the audience who have questions for Jerry, the best way to ask them is to type your question directly into the Q&A box, and I will answer them in the order that is they are received. Uh, it is best if you can actually, uh, Jerry, if you could leave that slide up um, till the I'll end. Leave it on, okay. Yeah, just in case anybody wants to get your contact info. Um, uh, best to type the question in the way that you would want to say it. Um, if you have if you have questions, so I don't have to do any on the fly interpretation of uh, of any questions here. But I'm happy to kick things off um, to get the conversation rolling. So, Jerry, in terms of of, of knockouts that you're making at the early stage to improve shelf life preservation and, and reduce um, senescence. Um, are, do any of those traits ever serve other important functions in plant and crop development? 
Oh, absolutely. So I mentioned that this switch is clearly analog, even with John Thompson's work using anti-stems, um, you really can't control where the genome, genome uh, modifications integrate. I mean, that's just the way it goes when you use agrobacterium or biolistics. So he found that he had to carefully screen through maybe a hundred different transformants to find ones that had the right level of downregulation of DHS. In other words, if he downregulated it too much, he got he got um, negative pleiotropic effects like flower sterility, uh, pollen sterility, or flower deformations. And if he downregulated it too much, it was lethal. So it's very clear that there's a sweet spot. In other words, if he didn't downregulate it enough, there was no phenotype; it was wild type. If he downregulated it too much, it was bad and even right. lethal. So there's that sweet spot. So the big question, the multi-million dollar question for Agrobody when we started getting into genome editing is if we knock out one, one of two copies of the diploid, one would think you'd have about 50% reduction in activity. Is that in the sweet spot? And it turned out in rice and canola and now tomatoes, it's pretty clear that is the case. That if we knock out one of two copies in a diploid, we get beneficial traits, but it doesn't mess up the plant. That, that was a key demonstration that we didn't know in advance, but we've proven it. We're now looking at, at polyploid crops like alfalfa and strawberries. So strawberries have eight copies of every gene. And what happens when we knock out one of eight or two of eight or three of eight? We presumably could knock out seven of eight. We won't find any that have all eight knocked out because we know that'll be useful. So it allows you the advantage of poly polyploid crops with a knockout is that you can tune it better. It's not one out of two or zero out of two knocked out, but it could be more, bit more, um, more fine tuned. Um, and so I'm not sure if that answers your question, David, but um, we also have other areas of the gene where we can knock it out and not, we can make a small deletion or point mutant and we can keep that homozygous. In other words, we can knock out both pieces of this one, a small in-frame deletion. We can knock out both copies and still get beneficial effects. So we have we can tune it pretty well even at this level, early, early stage. Yeah. So it's not it's not inconsequential, but it's um, but it can be controlled and then have to have a desired effect later later on. Right. And that's the point. So in other words, this is a pretty common path conceptually with a lot of targets, even essential genes, you first validate the target using transgenics in the lab or in the greenhouse. And then for product development, you move on to genome editing because of the regulation and because you don't have to worry about the drawbacks of transgenic, technical and social drawbacks of transgenic. Yeah. And that's exactly what we did in tomatoes and what we're doing in other crops. Yeah. And then with, with some of, so thinking about from the commercial standpoint, um, you know, there's a lot of people in the food waste world that are, you know, we've got waste repurposing, we've got, um, trying to sell food that's about to go bad and sort of the imperfect produce model. And then we have this sort of core prevention of waste, which I think we would agree is sort of the core area where the most value can be created if we can just fundamentally reduce waste at the beginning. Maybe. Right, a penny saved is a pound earned. Right, exactly. And so there's with this being a solution and then the appeals of the world, those who are trying to figure out how to do low cost, high efficacy, and you know, nutritionally negligible uh, coatings. If you start to solve some of the problems at a more genetic level, do you still see those solutions being used as sort of an additional piece, or is the is the supply chain price sensitive enough that they decide to sort of go with one or another? Do you have any early like indications of that from any of your customers? Yes, from the customers of my customers. So large scale distributors like Walmart and Costco are really interested in this problem and they're putting tons of money into it. My, my personal perspective is it's not an either or, sometimes one plus one equals five. And so if we can combine a genetic predisposition to lasting longer with some sort of a coating, that might put some crops in a whole new market phase. Yeah. Um, I, I know that Costco is really interested in reducing waste. They're looking at multiple technologies. They already have uh, appeal avocados on their shelves. Um, and so, you know, I think a rising tide lifts all boats. It's not either or. And the fact that appeal was able to raise such a ridiculous amount of money 
and what essentially is a pretty simple technology is, is a real validation of people putting money into this space. So I was really pleased to see it. Yeah. Um, we do have a, we do have a question from the audience here and, and uh, the member who asked it, don't worry, I think your question still is, is not, I don't think I asked your question specifically. So I think that we should be good here. Um, so what to you is currently the biggest challenge in licensing the technology to partners and then scaling the business from there? Right. Um, I think the biggest pushback I've had is the perception that we have inadequate proof of concept, especially with the big four. So typically when you're dealing with the big four uh, chem companies, they want you to have field trial data in their crop, preferably in their variety before they'll talk. It's not terribly different than um, having a new drug and the drug companies won't talk to a biotech until you have phase two data. And you're supposed to get that in your garage on your retirement money. And so it's not, not all that different. So in dealing with the biggest guys, the ones that could really help transform this technology into the marketplace, they essentially have their arms crossed uh, across their chest saying, you know, show me, come back when you have field trial data. And we do with alfalfa and we do with bananas, but that was with transgenics. And now we have it with potatoes. And so um, I think our mark, our sweet spot in the marketplace is dealing with mid-sized seed companies that are willing to take more of a risk. And maybe they're number two or number three in their particular crop, and they're willing to take a chance and put some of the upfront R&D money into this in the hopes that they can get the market first. Yeah, interesting. Well, I guess, uh, Jerry, with I'm going to pause here and see if there's any further questions from the audience um, before we jump to this next phase. So just give everybody a moment in case there's any lingering curiosities. The problem with no questions from the audience is I've either snowed you or um, or people are just shy. <laughs> um, I think it's probably it's probably shy, but this is. I mean, this is a really big opportunity. I guess one other thing on the commercial side, just to fill in here. Uh, so, what? It, who is the furthest along? Or maybe not who? Is, but like, what's the furthest along trial and proof of concept that you've gotten to so far um, that makes you the most excited right now? Oh, unquestionably, it's Simplot with yeah. their three years of potato field trials. They're really excited. They looked at a pretty large number of uh, candidates um, in the funnel, and uh, we're I think we're the only one or one of two that have come out the other end. So that's a really independent third party validation where they put a lot of resources into it. But you can imagine what it costs to run three years of field trials in multiple locations in a crop like potatoes. Yeah. You know, you get you get a hundred eyes from each plant instead of ten thousand seeds like from canola. So it's kind of painful to scale that up, it takes a long time. Yeah. They they were convinced enough to go through the third year and it passed past the gauntlet. So I expect that um, we'll, we'll get to commercialize a commercial commercialization decision fairly soon there. Yeah. Are there, with the thing about potatoes as a crop, I mean, are there certain crops that you're more excited about? Because I feel like all the coatings have gone after the high value, quick to waste, like all the right. are really high. Right. Right. But I almost wonder for like, pota for like potatoes, like I wonder if they can afford to use coatings like an appeal because the I assume the margins on potatoes are lower than that on like an avocado where people are willing to pay a lot of money for an avocado. Right. Well, think about it earlier in the in the path in the pathway. I mean, there's an enormous amount of potatoes that are lost during storage. Sure. They also tend to turn the starch turns to sugar, which is a really bad thing also. Yeah. Um, and so the shelf life is really more internal to the company and maybe during transport, not so much in consumer shelves. Yeah. The potatoes, once you buy it, tend to last longer than a lot of other vegetables. Um, I'll give you the example of strawberries. That's really exciting because there are some there are some heirloom varieties of strawberries that are incredibly tasty, super sweet, really delicious, wonderful color, wonderful texture, but they're non-commercial because they go bad in two days. So by the time they ship it, you know, from the farm to the wholesaler, it's it's rotten already. 
So we think we could revive some of those heirloom varieties and, and make a qualitative change, not a, just a quantitative change, to be able to introduce new improved genome edited varieties uh, someday. Now, again, that's still up in terms of public acceptance that we didn't get into that at all in this discussion. I talked about a lot, of, I talked about that a lot a year and a half ago in public acceptance of genome editing. That's a whole different discussion. But strawberries, what I've learned is that the appeal process requires a really big change to their process. Right now, strawberries are picked in the field. They're grown, harvested by the same people. It's really a high talent thing to be able to grow and pack a strawberry. So they actually pack the clamshells right in the field and take them to the refrigerator and ship them. Uh, the appeal process requires it to be done in bulk. And so that's a major change to bring all the strawberries together, tumble them with the, with the coating and then package them in the clamshells. That's really difficult. It's difficult for the farmers to do that. So again, um, you have to look at it with high granularity in terms of the harvesting and the processing of the crop. Um, how, how much shelf life is needed, the extended shelf life is needed, who's gonna pay for it, and how does it um, affect the process that farmers currently use? Interesting. Where can, where can you get a, uh, an heirloom strawberry, by the way? I'm looking these up on uh, Google Images right now, and they're they're pretty wild looking. Well, I think the answer came from uh, from Kevin again. It's uh, it's local. It's best if it's local. I yeah. lived in New Jersey uh, for my some of my childhood and uh, early adolescence, and uh, we used to get amazingly delicious tomatoes and strawberries right on the side of the road when when Central New Jersey was still the Garden State, and uh, they had farm stands all over the place. Um, I think those days are probably over, but um, that's the answer. You could only buy really tasty strawberries, especially the heirloom varieties, um, if you bought them locally. They just are not amenable to shipment. That's why we have the tomatoes we have now. They were designed for ship shipping, not designed for consumer taste. Got it. Um... Well, Jerry, before we wrap up here, uh, uh, we always like to ask our founders, CEOs, what are what are some things the audience can help you with? Well, we're not raising money now, so I'm not looking for money. Um, I'm looking for customers, <clears throat> and uh, especially those innovative seed companies who are willing to take a chance with technology and are, and are are excited about getting in on the ground floor. Excellent. That's a, that's a short answer. Great. Well, if you have any leads for Jerry, um, please find his uh, contact information here. Uh, and feel free, Jerry, find people to reach out to you directly. Sure, of course. Yeah, great. Well, Jerry, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, congrats on all the progress to date. I'm really excited about the AgriBody story and the problem you guys are working on. Um, I'd also like to thank our audience for your active participation today. Um, for everybody uh, on the call, we host these uh, webinars every Thursday at 3 p.m. Central. Um, the theme for April uh, will be precision agriculture, um, and you can register and apply to present by going to agrifoodconversations.com if you're interested. Also, if you know somebody who would like to watch this webinar, feel free to share the link with them directly. A uh, replay of this webinar will be emailed to you in the next 24 hours, um, but others can also just go to agrifoodconversations.com to view. Um, thanks, so much, say, thanks so much for everybody for joining us today. I'm um, having a great rest of your Thursday. See you next time. Thanks, David. Bye now.